So, first of all, it's a remarkable book. And before we talk about the book itself, Israel is an interesting topic to write about because there are many books about Israel. But maybe you could share with us, if you will, the genesis of this book. What made you feel like this was a story that, we, that needed to be told now? A lot of people ask that because there are some really incredibly wonderful books out there about Israel. The three main ones are obviously Howard Sacker's book, which came out in 76, but has been updated a bunch of times, and Sir Martin Gilbert, who came out with one in 98, and Anita Shapira's, which actually run the National Jewish Book Award a couple of years ago, where they're all excellent. There was a federation director from one of the country's major federations called me about three years ago and said, I'm bringing a group of people to Israel, and I want to give them a book to read about the country. It has to be the following. It cannot be ridiculously long. It cannot be a slog. It's got to kind of be a fun read. It has to be intellectually defensible, and it wouldn't be bad if it was a tiny bit inspiring as well. So I said to him, there's got to be something. I'll find it for you at the end of the day, and I'll write you back. And I went to my shelves, and it wasn't there. And I did what everybody else does, which, of course, go to Amazon. And it wasn't there. Uh, there are a lot of books about Israel, but they, Sacker's is 1,200 pages. Yeah. Martin Gilbert's 800 pages. So the first thing was that it needed to be accessible and needed to be brief, and it needed to be kind of a fun read. The other thing is that I don't think that any of those books that are out there actually are attuned to the ears of young Americans particularly, but not only young Americans, young American Jews, young American non-Jews, the evangelical community, older people. As was said by Gary earlier, there are some very, very particular questions that people have about Israel out there right now. And I thought that a book needed to be written that actually kind of had those questions in mind as it, as it told the story. Uh, so when I realized that it wasn't out there, when I actually realized that it's been since 1976 that an American Jew wrote a one-volume history of Israel, that's actually an extraordinary fact. And I would go so far as to say that it's actually an indictment of the leadership of the community that you and I both care deeply about here, that 40 years have elapsed and no one's seen fit to say somebody ought to like, tell the story in a way that our young people can actually wrap their arms around it. Nature abhors a vacuum not only in the natural world but in the world of discourse. Uh, and if we don't put out our narrative about what we think is right and just and fair about this story, then other things are going to fill that vacuum, and I think that we're seeing the results of that. So when I realized the book wasn't there, uh, I thought it would be a fun project. You know, it's interesting because many of the books that I think have been on the top of the Amazon bestseller list in recent years about Israel have been sort of anguished books, books about the conflict, books about the turmoil, you know, Ari Shavit's book, you know, Yossi Klein Halevi's book. There's, there's much of this, how do we sort through this? But your book is very different in just the tone itself. And I think it's dimensional in a way that's very nice because it starts with an examination of poetry, which is not what you would often think about, right, in a historical text. So talk to, if you would, a little bit about poetry and art and how that fits into your kind of view of, of, of Israel. Well, you're right that these other books, which are excellent, actually, um, do come from a place of tremendous anguish and inner turmoil, largely because they're focused on the conflict. And the first thing that it seemed to me that had to be done in telling the story was to make the conflict not the spine of the narrative. In other words, the conflict is there, it's got to be addressed, it's got to be invoked, both in the ways in which Israel's, I think, handled it admirably, but also the ways in which Israel's handled it, handled it much less than admirably. But to make the conflict the spine of the story and to suggest that by knowing something about the conflict, one knows something or understands Israel is analogous to saying something like, well, you don't know anything about America, but somebody asks you, tell me what America stands for. Let's imagine that they asked that back in an era in which we knew. And they, and they, they said, and you said the answer was, well, there was a war in 1776, and there was a war in 1812, there was a civil war between 62 and 65, and a First World War, and a second, I'll leave a bunch of them out, Second World War, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan. Those are all important events, and some of those wars were fought because of the values that America stands for. But you don't know anything about America if you know those wars. If you want to know America, you've got to read the Federalist Papers. You've got to read Thomas Jefferson's last public letter to his colleagues who had written the Declaration of Independence. You've got to read the Declaration of Independence. You've got to read Abraham Lincoln's Lyceum Address. You have to read Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail. And remember, by the way, that Martin Luther King was in jail not in China or in Korea, but he was in jail in the United States, and that letter we have now is that we have it because he wrote it in the margins of newspapers, ripped up the newspaper, and handed the little pieces to his visitors because he wasn't allowed to write or smuggle things out either. In other words, really great republics and really extraordinary democracies have really shady parts of their story. So the first thing that I wanted to do was not to fall into that 48, 56, 67, 73 milestone trap because it sets the wrong stage on which to build the story. 
So then the question becomes, what's the story about? What's the book really about? And the book that I wanted to write was a book which told not only what happened, but tried to give a sense of why it happened. What animated the people who, out of the middle of nowhere, decided, I mean, the most ridiculous thing in the world, to create a Jewish state if there hadn't been one for 2,000 years? What motivated people to move to swamp-ridden, you know, the parts of Israel where there was malaria and so forth, and to stick it out? And you had to get into the soul. And I think that the soul of the people who did this work, people who did the military work, the people who did the political work, the agricultural work, the soul actually comes out in Israel's writers, whether it's poems like, uh, poets like Bialik or Chernochovsky or Alterman, or whether it's novelists like David Grossman and Amos Oz. Uh, and it was important to me to show kind of a, long, a wide range, both of left-wing and right-wing and religious and secular and so forth, but also to see how actually some of these poets and writers' positions actually shift over the course of their own careers, because the nature of the reality on the ground there is, is that what makes sense to you at one period won't necessarily make sense to you in a different period. And part of the challenge for all of us, I think, is to become less wedded to our own positions than to an open engagement with a changing reality. So I wanted it to be about the soul of the Jewish people, and I thought the poets and the writers were the place to start. I mean, I think that's very powerful because the written word seems in my many ways to exemplify the Jewish people, right, over the course of millennia. So I think that's a powerful way to start the narrative in a really interesting frame. But now I'm thinking about what you said about the, these remarkable pioneers who came from Europe and the Middle East to settle this land and to, if you'll forgive the term, drain the swamp and to undertake this, <laughs> sorry, I had to slip it in, and to undertake this project of sort of building a homeland. And in many ways, you know, Zionism is this organic, I think, this, this, this movement that wells up inside all of us, right, who, 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 who um, are Jews. And it's almost embedded in our DNA, this desire to be free in our own ancestral homeland. But it's also impossible not to note that it was also a reaction to anti-Semitism in places like Europe or in places like the Middle East, whether it was explicit violence or the implicit status of being second-class citizens who are always uncertain. Talk to us about the relationship, as you see it, between anti-Semitism, which is really, again, I think a topic and relevant right now, and Zionism. They're obviously intertwined, kind of like a strand of DNA, and it's very hard to think about one piece of the strand without the other. And clearly, you know, when Chaim Nachman Bialik writes that first poem that he ever publishes in 1882, To the Bird, and he speaks to this bird that's kind of figuratively flown to his windowsill from the warmer climes of the Middle East. And he says, does, does dew still, still fall like pearls on Mount Hermon, which he said by quoting the Bible? Does God still have mercy on Zion? Quoting the Bible. Again, he kind of, he'd never been there, but he kind of knew the valleys and the rivers and the peaks and because he'd read the Bible so much. But then he also asks, do calamities also happen there the way they happen here? And he writes from a kind of a place of a broken heart. And that's why he becomes almost overnight a sensation. And Jabotinsky later said that it was Chaim Nachman Bialik more than anybody else who had the capacity with a pen to capture the soul and to, and to describe the soul of the Jewish people. It would be nice to say that at a certain point, Zionism moved beyond that, and it became its own thing without having to depend or on or react to anti-Semitism. The tragedy of the world is that the world's never given Zionism an opportunity to do that. In other words, Zionism, anti-Semitism keeps morphing. It's one of these strange viruses that morphs a lot, and they have the virus, and we die from it. But it's a, um, no, so that's really, it's really true. But um, it's motivated at the beginning by anti-Semitism, but it's still affected by anti-Semitism. In my neighborhood, uh, if you walk around now in an afternoon and take a little walk, you hear something very different than what you heard four, five, six years ago. You hear a lot of French. And there's a lot of things that are wonderful about that. Uh, the bakeries are much better than they used to be. <laughs> Uh, and it's a gorgeous language, but it's sad and it's sobering because you hear the French and you realize the Jews are fleeing Europe again. I mean, it's 2016 and in the lifetime of some people in this room, Jews fled once before and now they're fleeing again. And there's something horrifyingly sober about that. So what I try to say in the book is that Zionism is really not about anti-Semitism. Zionism is about the Jewish people returning to its ancestral homeland to reimagine itself. What would we like Judaism and Jewishness to be? When we set the terms, when we speak our own language, when we set our own calendar, when we make the laws, we govern theoretically most of it. That's what I think really the essence of this movement really is. Yeah. Tragically, in history though, it's been very hard to separate it out from repeated waves and different forms of anti-Semitism. Yeah. 
I mean, it's interesting. I remember being quite, quite pained when President Obama went to Cairo for that landmark speech that he gave early on in his presidency, and he talked about Israel being a reaction to the Holocaust, which seemed to me a tragic misinterpretation of Zionism. It was a tragic misinterpretation of Zionism, and I have to say, um, as someone who has not been exactly short of criticism of President Obama, um, he did a remarkable job of rewriting that narrative in his eulogy for Shimon Peres. Yep. I thought it was actually extraordinary that a man who actually is very reticent to talk about American exceptionalism used the phrase Israeli exceptionalism in that, in that eulogy. And he made a very clear point, given the fact that Shimon Peres was the last of Israel's founding fathers, he made a very clear point to retell the narrative, and he spoke about it as a kind of a fulfillment of thousands of years of Jewish yearning. Uh, I think he really, to his credit, by the way, just as I said before, you know, it, it behooves us all to rethink our positions as reality on the ground changes. He did an extraordinarily courageous thing in giving a very different kind of speech and moving from what had been a mistake, probably of one of his you know, staff people, yeah. Um, to really getting it right. I thought it was actually a, a beautiful eulogy, and um, I give him a lot of credit for what he, the way he described what we're all about. You know, I would say, actually, that speech that he gave, and I had the privilege of being there and hearing it, was so remarkable. For those who haven't read it, it was so remarkable. He also gave a very brilliant speech at Addis Israel about a year before. You know, he was defending the JCPOA. Now, I know you're not a fan of the JCPOA. I might not be a fan of it either. And yet, he was able to articulate as an African-American, the, the, the case for Zion is the case for Jewish self-determination in a way that I thought was really powerful. Yeah, I mean, again, we, we may or may not agree about everything that he has said or done. We probably disagree about some of it, but that's neither here nor there. For those of you that haven't read um, his book, uh, what is it, Memor Dreams from My Father, I think yeah. it's called? Um, you know, when I read that book right after the Bush presidency, I thought it was really remarkable to read a book um, by a president who actually not only could read but could write. And um, I think we're gonna actually really long for those days very soon again. And um, there was something really unbelievably beautiful in that book. Uh, even though, again, I've had my really serious differences with the president about all sorts of issues, he talks about going back to Africa and not looking different mm. and not feeling different. And his hair was just like everybody else's hair. And the lilt of his walk was just like the lilt of everybody else's walk. And he said it was going back to Africa that he understood what it finally meant to be home. And I think that he, because of that experience, actually does have a key to understanding what it is for the Jews to be sovereign in their own ancestral homeland and to really be home and not to live at the behest of or the largesse of anyone else. You know, he's a very smart guy. Uh, he knows history. And he knows that in 1290, when England decided he didn't want Jews, there were no Jews. I and mean, in 1492, when Spain didn't want any more Jews, there were no Jews. And people didn't just leave. They left and became impoverished overnight because they had nothing to take with them. And I think he really does deep down. I was never someone who said that he was an enemy of the state of Israel. I don't think he ever was. Disagree about policy. That's fine. Disagree with Israelis about policy. Uh, but he really does, I think, understand what it is to kind of find one's ethnic ancestral a place of comfort, and I think that really came through beautifully, especially in the eulogy, but also to a certain extent in that Addis Israel yeah, speech. Yeah, so I agree, and, and, and I'm actually thinking about something you said a minute ago. I want to go back to it. You talked about Jabotinsky, and in the book you talk about Jabotinsky and his sort of prescient pessimism about what was happening in Europe and what happened to the Jews, and by the way, you know, his own view on sort of the futility of, ac of accommodating, you know, the, the indigenous Arab population in Israel or the land that became Israel. So how does his pessimism square with kind of your worldview, if you will, about where, we, where Israel moves forward vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors? Well, first of all, people in my family would tell you that his pessimism squares perfectly with my personality. And, um, <laughs> you know, last Monday, I was talking to the, the day before, uh, I was talking to my brother who was in New York, and I was in Jerusalem, and we were talking about my mom, but uh, I said to him, I'm really worried about tomorrow. He said, what are you talking about? The New York Times puts her at 91%, Project 538 puts her at 87%. You're just you. You worry about everything. It's going to be fine. Okay. In any event, um, I don't see Jabotinsky as a pessimist, though. I see Jabotinsky as a clear-eyed realist, and I actually see him as a person who took the Arabs much more seriously than the Israeli left did, or the pre-state the pre Zionist left did. And what Jabotinsky said to people like Ben-Gurion, and he said it also about Herzl, he said, you know, when you, Herzl said this explicitly in Altnoyland, a novel that he published in the first years of the 20th century. And he doesn't say it because it's a novel, but he says basically, there is an indigenous Arab population there, they're, they're living there, but we're gonna bring technology, we're gonna bring water, we're gonna bring hygiene, and they're gonna embrace us because we're gonna bring all these things that they never had before. 
And Jabotinsky looks at him and says, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And when you think that, you don't take them seriously as human beings. They love their land as much as you love your land. For them, it's home as much as it is home for you. And you bring them pipes and hygiene, they're going to appreciate that, but they're not going to give up their tenacious love of their land and their desire to be there. Uh, I don't think that's pessimism. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually clear-eyed realism. And there's a way in which the sort of starry-eyed uh, optimism of people like Herzl and then Ben-Gurion and you know that whole train of people, probably all the way through Rabin, who really kind of believed that there was something about, they believed that the, the, the world in the Middle East was very much like the world in the West. They thought it was like that, at least. Um, so I really see Jabotinsky as much more of a realist than, a, than as a pessimist. And for better or for worse, and probably a little bit of both, history has proved him right. Mm -hmm. well, so that's interesting as you think about how Jabotinsky saw the world and how Ben-Gurion or the Herzlian sort of view of the world. Because it reflects the fact, I think, that there have always been these stark differences in the way Jews view Zionism and uh, the Zionist pioneers viewed the state they were creating and what was the best path forward. And it's funny because Gary started with his introduction, talked about the cleavages of divides here, right now, in this country, in this town, about where we are and where we're headed. And you describe, I think, in, in a really rich sort of way that, that cleavage. And you talk about the fight over the Altalena and the arms and the Haganah's policy. Talk about those cleavages, that divide, if you will, and how you think it still factors in today. Well, there's lots of them. There's lots of divides, obviously. First of all, before Zionism, or as Zionism picked up, there was a huge disagreement about whether or not the Jews ought to create a state. I mean, even inside the Zionist club, there was a question of what are we actually doing? Are we building a state, which is what Herzl wanted to do? Or are we building some sort of spiritual center, which is what Achad Am wanted to do? Now, by the way, the interesting thing is we actually have both. And I try to point out at the end of the book that what's come to fruition in Israel is actually the embodiment of both Herzl's dream, which is a state, and Achad Am's dream, which is a kind of a wellspring of Jewish spiritual substance, intellectual substance, and so forth. And you couldn't have Achad Am's success without Herzl's. And if Herzl had had his way and Achad Ahmed not had his way, Herzl's country would be basically meaningless. So at the end of the day, that particular divide, I think, is bridged over in the current state of Israel. But there's obviously a socialist versus a free market divide. There is a religious versus a secular divide. There's kind of what you call the optimist versus the pessimist in terms of dealing with the local population. Um, there are... There's a huge divide at, at the time of the First World War. Do you side with the Ottomans or with the British? Uh, at a certain point earlier, there's the question of when the British uh, offer uh, what's basically called the Uganda plan, even though it was really technically in Kenya. Uh, do you go for that or do you not go for that? It actually almost split the movement irrevocably. I mean, part of the tragedy of Herzl's life, and there's a lot of tragedy in his life, uh, is that he dies less than a year after the Zionist Congress basically falls apart over the Uganda plan. He goes to his grave thinking that he himself, by raising the Uganda plan, had destroyed the very movement that he himself had given birth to. Um, it, obviously, it recouped and it regrouped, but um, Herzl probably did not know that when he, when he died at a very young age. So there's a debate, do we want to go to someplace else or does it have to be Palestine? Do we wait for the British? Do we side with the Ottomans? There was a, de there was a huge debate in the Executive Council uh, in May 1948, do we declare independence or do we not? And most of the assessments from the military people were, we're not going to hold out. The CIA and the, and the State Department, as I point out in the book, they, gave, they told Truman not to recognize the state. Their estimation was that the Jews, as they called them, would hold out for a maximum of 18 months. And they said to Truman, if the Jews get recognition and then they start to fail, you're going to have to send in troops. This is 1948. It's three years after 1945. Americans are not looking for another war. Stay out of this. Truman, for a whole array of reasons, uh, did not stay out of it, Eddie Jacobson being part of the story, but certainly not the whole story. Uh, but there's a huge debate in May 1948. Do we declare independence or do we not? I mean, this is, and part of, the, part of what's, I think, important about that, that whole history of all of these disagreements is that it's very hard to appreciate the vitriolic and combative nature of Israeli politics if you don't understand the ideological ferment from which it stems. You know, I guess this is an opportunity at, at that juncture to sort of say a collective thank you because over the years that I've been coming back, every time the subject sort of turns towards Israeli politics, I get very self-conscious and a little bit apologetic and feel a little bit embarrassed. 
uh, but we're feeling, we're feeling very good. So um, also kind of a collective thank you for making us feel really terrific about, um, about our own political system, for making our prime minister seem rather Churchillian in his own way. Um, <laughs> So we're really, it's, a great, it's been a great trip. So, um, but you really can't understand the battle between Israel's labor and Likud, or the Haredim and the non-Haredim, or Israel's Arabs and Israel's Jews, unless you understand that all of these arguments have their antecedents way, way, way back, really at the beginning of the 20th century. And if you don't understand the beginning of the 20th century, you can't understand today, which is why the book starts not with 1948, right. but with 1897. So. You have this debate, and you have this constant sort of intellectual ferment, right? But what's interesting, and you write in the book about sort of the revolution that happened in 1977 with Begin and the, the sort of the rise of the Likud. And if you look at Israeli politics today, it feels like, as someone said to me, you know, I talked about ADL, as we do here in the US, endeavoring to be in the middle of Israeli politics, in the middle of the Israeli political spectrum. And this gentleman said to me, okay, well, you can be, in, and I don't want us to be tilting in one direction or the other, by the way. And this gentleman said to me, well, you can be here in the middle, but if the society moves to the right and you're still in the middle, you find yourself on the left. Talk about the rise of the sort of right in Israel, if you will, maybe the political, from the political right, the religious right, and how do we as Americans who are struggling with this on our own square those things? At another time, it's really a fascinating thing to actually think about the parallels between 77 in Israel and 2016 in America a kind of an uprising of the, uh, the common folk to a certain extent, an uprising of the right overturning the elitism of the left. I mean, that's exactly the way that Begin ran for office in 77. Begin was elected, I mean, Begin was the consummate Polish gentleman, right? I mean, he was, he was from Brisk, he'd come from Poland, uh, he was proud of being from Poland, he's one of those few Israeli leaders who did not change his last name. Right? I mean, Ben-Gurion required most people to change their last name to prove not only they could have a cute-sounding Hebrew-Israeli name, but they were shedding their European skin. You were actually changing yourself. You change your name, you change yourself. So, you know, David Gruen became David Ben-Gurion, and Arik Shireman became Arik Sharon, and Golda Meyerson became Golda Meir. Menachem Begin stayed Menachem Begin. Uh, first of all, he didn't have to change his name because Ben-Gurion ben -Gurion never let him into the government, so he didn't have that problem. But he also was very proud of being a Polish gentleman, and yet he swept into office on a wave of anger of the Mizrahim, of the North African dark-skinned Jews from you know, Tunisia and Algeria and Morocco and then further along Yemen and Iraq and Iran. Um, there is an uprising in, in, in 1977 and Israeli politics moves significantly to the right. Now, it's important to point out a couple of things. It's as when Israeli politics moves to the right that Israel signs its first peace treaty. I mean, all those years of left-leaning governments had never been able to eke out a treaty because the nature of Israeli politics, think about it, you always have to make accommodations in order to make a deal. So if you're on the right, what's the left going to do? Try to outright the right and say no to the deal? They're not going to do that. So Begin actually had to fight his own right flank. By the way, just as Bibi has to fight his own right flank constantly, and some of the things that he says that may make many of the people in this room absolutely want to pull their hair out, and it's certainly true of me as well. You just have to remember that there's a lot of internal politics going on, and some of it's for the consumption of European cabinet uh, parliaments, but a lot of it's for the consumption of rank-and-file Israelis in terms of his positioning himself. But the move to the right actually brought peace. So that's part of what needs to be understood. And then it was, um, you know, then from that, from Egypt, then you, could, then you could move on to Jordan. The move to the right is happening everywhere in the world. I mean, Brexit, in a certain way, is a reflection of a kind of a move to the right. Certainly, the United States this week and last week is a move to the right. There's a way in which I think Americans who are um, very concerned about Israel's move to the right or very condescending at times about Israel's move to the right need to recognize this is a worldwide phenomenon. This is not Israel. This is the West. Something's happening in the West where actually fear is having a huge impact. And Israelis have been afraid for a really very long time. Uh, and uh, I think at the end of the day, the move to the right today is actually an embrace of Jabotinsky. It is just about, let's not pretend that what we know is not true is true. Uh, and since, they, since most Israelis think that there's not a deal to be had, then let's not pretend that there's a deal to be had right now, and let's conduct our affairs of state in such a way that we leave the option open for the future, uh, but we're not going to be anybody's you know, whipping post or anything else of the sort. Now, we may disagree about exactly what Israel's doing in the interim. I'm not happy with what Israel's doing in the interim in every way. But I think the move to the right is, again, a comment of a Jabotinskyism 
clear-eyedness about where we find ourselves. You know, just one last, two weeks ago, um, in the Palestinian Authority, they named a square, they always name squares, I don't know how many squares they have in Ramallah, but apparently a lot, but um, I'm not allowed to go. But they named a square for the mastermind of the Munich Olympic Massacre. That's lovely. You know, no, but it's, it's more than lovely. I mean, in all seriousness, Israelis read that. And then they say, who are we really kidding here? Right. Who are we really kidding that the reason there's not a deal is because we just added seven houses to a settlement? The people that laud the mastermind of the slaughtering of Jews in Germany at the Olympics so many decades later, still turning them into heroes, Israelis say at a certain point, you know, it really doesn't matter what Washington thinks. And it doesn't really matter what London or Berlin think because we know who's living 15 miles away from us. And you and I don't have to love the move to the right, but the move to the right stems from that as much as it stems from anything else. Look, I think, I think that's very fair. I think that's very, very correct. I think that the realities of the region and, and their neighbors lead Israelis to very logical conclusions in many ways. But so it's interesting to talk about this fear. And the fear, I think, even as an American Jewish community, the Shoah is in the back of our minds. How many people here, are there any child survivors in the room? More than a few. Uh, how many of you had a parent or a grandparent who you lost in the Shoah? So for American Jews, right, the Shoah is still very present. And you write in the book, I think, in a very important part about the Eichmann trial and the first time Israeli society really came to grips with the Holocaust. Talk about how Israel has reckoned with that memory. And if you would, again, being, having an American perspective as well, to a degree, how you reconcile where we, how we deal with that memory versus the Israelis. It's still very complicated. Just to start at the end of the story for a second, uh, it's, it's a kind of an informal requirement of all Israeli high schools that at some point, like usually in 11th grade or 12th grade, the kids take a trip to Poland. And it's uh, usually pretty, it's privately funded by the parents, they pay for their kids to go. Uh, and you know, some kids go, some kids don't go, but it's kind of part of a rite of passage of Israeli high school life. And we went to each of the parent meetings for each of our kids as they were getting ready to go to Poland. And there's obviously, um, there, were, there was, not obviously, there were people in each class, in each of our kids' three classes, where there were parents who said, my kid's not going. And it's not because some people said, I'm not giving the Poles my money. You know, they killed my grandparents, I'm not sending my money back there. I'm at, you, know, you can't argue with that. But there were a lot of people who said, that's not the issue. They said, here's the thing. If, because the teachers would say it's going to be a powerful experience, it's going to be a life-altering experience, they're going to come back and appreciate Israel in a whole new way. And some parents said, it's just not possible that we are living here in our own sovereign land and you, a professional educator, are telling me the only way to make them really appreciate this country is to send them to the country where they murdered 90% of the Jews. It was kind of a principled thing. So that the battle about the place of the Shoah in, in Israeli life and thought is still very much alive. Now, Israelis have trouble grappling with it, just like Americans have trouble grappling with it. I mean, Americans don't really talk about it until Elie Wiesel, who passed away not long ago, writes night. I mean, that opens up the floodgates. And it didn't happen in this country because the survivors didn't really want to talk about it. Elie Wiesel kind of gives them both permission and almost a command to begin talking about it. Now, in Israel, the survivors didn't want to talk about it either, but it's even more complicated because the Israelis who'd been in Palestine before the Shoah didn't want to hear about it. Because right. Israel and Zionism was about creating this new Jew. It was the Jew who was not the victim anymore. It was the Jew in those posters that are actually in the book, uh, you know, with the, the, brawn, the brawny, bronzed, angular men and women. Literally, in those posters, the men and women look almost identical, yeah. uh, which is not, you know, whatever. But, um, <laughs> but it makes a point. This was not about gender. It was about refashioning the human being. And these people who came straggling out of the camps you know, in these striped shirts, emaciated, were the exact opposite of the Jew that the Zionists in the 20s and 30s who were draining the swamps and building the cities wanted to create. They were ashamed of them. And um, they didn't want to talk about them. And Israel's come a long way since the Eichmann trial in embracing them, except that I think it's important to point out, and I do point this out in the book, not completely embracing them. There are still lots of survivors of the Holocaust who are now in their 80s and 90s, who live way under the poverty line. And it's, it's an abomination. I mean, whatever you want to say about Israel's budget, there is enough money there to give basic sustenance to the people who saw the worst possible behavior that human beings are capable of. 
And um, so Israel still grapples with it. And there's a way in which you know, the, the, the Holocaust, the Shoah, animates Israel and is a kind of an, exp it's, the, it's the epitome of the phenomenon that leads to Zionism. We talked about that whole anti-Semitism thing before. But there's a way in which it also ossifies you. When you see the entire world as Nazis in potentia, every enemy out there would just really like to round you up. It can ossify you when you can, be, you can find yourself unable to move. And that's also part of what's happening in Israel. I don't want to mention the person, but there is a senior member of the Israeli cabinet now in whose office I was not that long ago, who has but one picture on his wall in his office. And it's that picture of the little boy in the Warsaw Ghetto with his hands in the air. This is a person who was born in Israel, right? I mean, or, uh, not true, but was born after the Shoah. When that's the only picture in your office, yeah. you're saying something about the Jewish condition that I think actually Zionism was meant to undo, and yet it looms and it haunts. And when Miri Regev said that not long ago, that every single visitor to Israel has to go both to Yad Vashem and to the Kotel, to the Western Wall, which was a ludicrous suggestion in my opinion, but she's saying something about the Israeli sense of self, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial, and the wall, the Temple Mount, and so on and so forth. Um, we're wrestling. Memory is both very, very directing, and it's very ossifying at the same time. So if you were to have that job of Minister of Culture or Tourism, what's your exact title? Something like something that. Like yours, yeah, really long. Uh, really long. Uh, <laughs> what would be on your itinerary for mandatory stops, or strongly suggested stops, for that first time visitor to Israel? Well, not Miri Regev's office, that's the first thing, but um, that's a really great question. Um, that's a really great question. Here's what I want them to see. I would take them to an emergency room. Okay, we are being sponsored in part by Hadassah, so let's take the Hadassah emergency room. Okay, here's a, here's a true story. Here's a true story, unlike everything else that I've said tonight. Um, <laughs> On Rosh Hashanah in 2000, uh, I went to shul and didn't feel well. Those two are very often tied together. Um, but this time I really didn't feel well. And at the end of the day left, Rosh Hashanah services in the middle got in my car and drove to Ain Karem to the emergency room and said to them, I think I'm sick. And about an hour or two later, as they were prepping me for an appendectomy, there were three people, there were four people in the OR. I was, of course, the star. Thank you very much. There was a Russian-born Jewish surgeon. There was a Haredi woman who was the nurse. And there was an Arab anesthesiologist. By the way, the Arab anesthesiologist said to me, we'd been in Israel not that long at that point, he said, how much do you weigh? And I told him how many pounds I weighed. And he said, well, what's that in kilo? And I said, I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> and he said, lo nora ninachesh. Don't worry about it, we'll guess. And I see this mask coming down, and I'm like, Oh my God, that's the last thing I remember, and I guess he guessed, he guessed correctly. But I think that that image of whoever the patient has to be, you know, a Haredi nurse, a foreign-born Jewish surgeon, and an Arab anesthesiologist, and the patient could be a Jew or an Arab, I think it's actually much more important that they go see an emergency room than that they see the Kotel. Really, because you can see the Kotel on any you know, one of those little constant cameras, a gazillion different websites have a camera. Go look at the Kotel right now on your cell phone. But you can't get into an emergency room, and I think it really embodies uh, what Israel's all about. I would take them, I would take them actually to Har Herzl, but I wouldn't take them to the normal places in Har Herzl. I would take them to this little cave in Har Herzl, which is dedicated to the children who fought in the underground. And there's plaques on the wall. It's got his or her name, you know, Abraham Green whatever. 12 years old, died in the performance of his mission. 12, 16, 13. It's mind-boggling. I mean, think about the 12 and 13-year-olds that you know, that you're raising, or that your children are raising. It's mind-boggling. And I would take them there to see just, you know, how much an entire society has given for this. But I wouldn't focus, you know, only on that. If I could pick the day, I would have taken them la this past Yom Kippur, when we were up in Chispin, which is a little village to the east of the Kinneret. So some people call it Israeli-occupied Syria. We call it the Golan. But um, why were we in Chispin? Because somebody called us at Shalem College and said there's a group of about 80 completely secular Israeli kids, but I mean completely secular, who are not going to go to a synagogue on Yom Kippur. That they are not going to do. 
but they also don't want to be on the beach. They're looking for something to do that's going to make the day meaningful. We're gathering together some people together. They're going to teach. They're going to sing. They're going to meditate. They're going to rest. They're going to go on walks. We need some teachers to come. Will you come and do it? Um, somebody else asked me before as we were milling around outside, do you ever get nervous? Uh, yes, when I had to ask my wife if we could go there for Yom Kippur, I got very nervous, but I caught her at a good moment, and we went to Chispin. And to watch these kids who are the children and grandchildren of those hyper-secular settlers of the swamps and the drainers of the swamps and the settlers of the Galilee, so many, you know, a couple generations ago, desperately clawing their way back into the tradition, wanting not to be what Paul Cowan called in the title of his famous book, Orphans in History, wanting to be anchored somehow. I think that's what Israel's all about. And I wouldn't take them to Yad Vashem necessarily, although it's unbelievably powerful, and I would certainly not take them to, um, to the wall. And leaving aside foreign dignitaries, you know, there's this phenomenon in Israel of bringing people on these trips, and sort of the ritzier trips, you get to go to an army base. I always thought that was obscene, really obscene. I mean, even though all three of my kids served on army bases. But if you came to America for two weeks, you, know, you go to the Liberty Bell, you go to the National Archives, you go to this, you go to that, you go to see Google, you go to see Universal Studios, you're gonna go to Fort Bragg? No, I mean, really seriously, why would, you, why would you possibly do that? Now, I understand partly it's because an Israeli military base is kind of the embodiment of the change, the new Jew, that Zionism was all about. But it also becomes a kind of a celebration of militarism that I think is really problematic for not only for Israelis, but especially for how non-Israelis look at Israel. So I think that, but I, so I would take him to an emergency room, I would take him to Chispin on Yom Kippur, um, I would take him to places where they see tremendous acts of courage, but also tremendous acts of optimism and hope. Um, and if they never saw the Kotel, I would be fine with that. It's interesting because, you know, you write in the book about how American Jewish attitudes really warmed toward Israel in the late 60s and early 70s. And then you write about, you know, the, the rise of the Intifada and Palestinian nationalism, and you write about the Israeli presence in the West Bank and Gaza, and then Sabra and Shatila being a bit of a moment when the Israeli and American, when the divide started. And I'm thinking about these young people you saw in the Gol, what I'll call the Golan. Uh, and we have a challenge, I think, with our young people today and how they connect with Israel and how they deal with these, these, these issues that I'm alluding to that you talk about in the book. Talk about how you see that, based on the history as you write it, how you see that evolving going forward. Well, I partly wrote the book to speak to those people and to try to give another narrative of what Israel's about in which occupation and militarism and Saab and Shatil and all that are not at the center of the story. They are important parts of the story, but they're not what the story's about. What happened here? It's obviously very complicated and nobody understands it fully, but partly young American, a, a, gener a current generation of young American Jews moved from their grandparents' natural embrace of particularism to a kind of a natural embrace of universalism and particularism became very uncomfortable. That's, that's number one. And that was kind of part of the whole American liberal movement. I mean, and that was, by the way, what the European Union was about. I mean, there was a lot of phenomena of people kind of abandoning particularity and moving towards some kind of wider embrace of humanity, which is a wonderful idea in a lot of ways. Uh, and, but that makes the idea of a country for a specific religion kind of a, kind of a weird thing. Uh, and to the extent that we always imagine Israel as a kind of a, you know, Hebrew-speaking, falafel-eating version of the United States, well, the United States, in theory at least, wasn't about a particular ethnicity or a particular religion. It was about human potential, and it was about opportunity for all. And then to see a kind of little mini America, but it putting the Jew at the center, became very hard for a younger generation to kind of square that with their conception of democracy. That's number one. Number two is, just as they were coming of age, the move to the right that you talked about earlier with the Begin's election in 77, uh, and then Begin, of course, goes into, into, um, into Lebanon in the early 80s, and that's a, just a disaster, just an unbelievable disaster, and the worst moment of it is obviously Sabra and Shatila, in which it's important to point out, you know, no Israeli killed anybody, yeah. uh, but Arik Sharon was actually, you know, accused by his own government of having looked the other way yeah. um, as, as Christians slaughtered Muslims. And it was a, a terrible, it's a blight on Israel's record, and I, by the way, this is an aside, I wanted to shoot this book right down the middle of the aisle. 
Mm. You know, and I, um, when I write, either for Bloomberg or for The Post or wherever, you know, I tell my wife all the time, if the, if the hate mail alternates each week between the right hating me and the left hating me, yeah. uh, I figure I'm doing a pretty good job of shooting it down the middle. And when I, when I gave this book in its draft form to several people, then one person said to me, oh my God, I can't believe you wrote this book. Don't you love this country? I thought you loved this country. And another person I gave it to said, what'd you do, write an APAC manual? Um, <laughs> and they read exactly the same book. So I thought, okay, this book is in the middle, and that's fine. And I think that putting it in the middle means both embracing the extraordinary accomplishments that are part of Israel's story, but not shying away from speaking about the failures. I don't think anybody in this country, and this is a week to really talk about that, nobody thinks that being a great American patriot means I can't say anything negative about America or its leadership. Absolutely. That's not what being a great patriot is. It's not what being a great parent is, right? I mean, my kid's perfect. My kid doesn't need any correction. It does not make for great kids. And I don't understand why Americans think it's okay to criticize America, but the Zionists in them think it's never okay to criticize Israel. You can lovingly criticize something. You can criticize something because you believe it's extraordinary, both in reality and in potential, and you want it to get better. So those people who um, don't think that any criticism of Israel is legit are really not going to like this book. And those people who think that Israel's born in sin are not going to like this book. Um, so what happens is a younger generation of American Jews now embraces universalism. Israel moves to the right. Palestinians get very smart. They can't beat Israel on the battlefield. They, the economic boycotts of the 70s don't work. And they realize that the most powerful weapon at their disposal is a keyboard. And they begin to assail Israel, not by trying to shoot people or blow them up. They do that a little bit too, obviously. They try to convince the world that Israel is the newest South Africa, or Israel is the newest colonialist power. And largely because we have been silent in putting out our own narrative, they not only convince Europe, they convince us. And though that plus, you know... Wait, who, who's us? The American Jews? The, Amer okay. the Jews at large and American yeah. Jews in particular. And then let's be honest, the, the occupation, you know, call it the occupation, you can call it the Jewish presence in Judea and Samaria, you know, whatever. Whether you think it's there forever or you think it can end tomorrow, whether you think it's justified or you think it's unjustified, whether you think it's a relatively benign occupation or you think it's a wantonly cruel occupation, whatever you think, Israeli soldiers are there and there's a couple of million Palestinians living under the thumb of Israeli soldiers. That's a very hard thing for me. It's a very hard thing, I can tell you, for my kids. And it's a very, very hard thing for young American Jews who, by the way, don't always know exactly how the occupation got started and don't know about Khartoum, no peace, no recognition, no negotiations, which basically sealed, made the occupation inevitable to a certain extent. Uh, but I think all of those things, the embrace of the universal, Israel's move to the right, um, and of course the, the gradual shift in Israeli politics and then the occupation, that, that all comes together as a kind of a perfect storm and we haven't put out our own narrative into a certain extent. The book is an attempt to correct at least some of that by putting out a narrative of a way of looking at this. You know, you know, you talk about the, the future of the territories as the most contentious issue in Zionism. And I think you're sort of laying that out. What would you say is the role then, considering, I think what, by the way, is a very reasonable criticism that you're, you're leveling about the inability for the Amer of many in the American Jewish establishment to talk about Israel in a the same sophisticated way that we talk about our own country, to have the ability to have insightful and honest and constructive conversations about its challenges, just like we do our country's challenges. What do you think is the role of American Jews and Jews in diaspora as Israel struggles with this most contentious issue? I think the criticism is completely legitimate. I want to start with that. I think the criticism is legit. Uh, you can't be Israel and say, we want your support, and we want your money, and we want your this, and we don't want to hear what you think. That's not a relationship. And I don't think that Israel has any right to say that. Here's what I say to, you guys have this phrase you love, you know, called thought leaders. I'm not quite sure what that is, but um, we used to call them public intellectuals, I think. But in any event, to these, these thought leaders who I, are my friends, actually, and um, they're the ones leading the charge in all this criticism of Israel. And here's what I say. It's all legit, but I'm going to open up your Facebook page, and I'm going to open up your Twitter feed, and I want to see the balance. So there's going to be criticism of Israel, how much is out there just lauding Israel for things having nothing to do with the conflict, which are just really incredible? And if you open up these people's pages, you see very little of the latter and almost exclusively the former. That's the first problem. 
that if you want to be in a relationship, if, my, if I tell you I love my kid, but all my kid hears from me is criticism, at the end of the day, my kid and I have no relationship. I can tell you that I love him as much as I want, but it doesn't make any difference. Yeah. And what Israelis are hearing from a lot of American Jews is nothing but relentless criticism over a situation that we don't know how to end. Just don't know what to do. If you have an idea, tell us. I mean, some Israelis, very few Israelis, even the Israeli left, by the way, doesn't think that there's a solution to this, just got to press the right button. The only disagreement is what do you do in the interim? The, 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 right, the divide between right and left is not we can have peace, we can't have peace. It's given that we can't have it now, how should we conduct ourselves? And those are legitimate questions to have. So the first thing is the balance. Open up the Twitter feed, open up the Facebook page. How much of it's just waves of criticism and how much of it is kind of just love? Second thing is there's an implicit critique. You know, I'll put the names out there. Peter Beinart's a friend of mine. Um, I, I don't know Jeremy Benjamin as well, but I respect him. Um, but I say to Peter and Jeremy, you know, there's a kind of, there's a kind of, there's a veiled threat, which is, if you guys don't start behaving the way we want you to behave, we're going to wash our hands of you. Then you don't really care. Then you don't really care. Because if you really care, let's say every time that Bibi doesn't do what he says he's going to do about women at the wall, for example, which rightly enrages many American Jews, and then people say, okay, if he doesn't make that little shared space, we're walking away. Then I'd say, okay, then you don't care. Here's what you should do. There are some Orthodox rabbis like Benny Lau and Shlomo Riskin and others who believe very strongly that Reformed Jews and American Jews and conservative Jews should be able to pray at the wall and have you know, mixed, mixed services. Give them $10 million a year. So they have unlimited resources to begin to try to create a dialogue inside Israel about what Judaism should look like in the 21st century. Don't walk away, because the minute you threaten to walk away, the Israelis say, then you really, really don't care, because when you walk away from your kid, you destroy that relationship. And when you walk away from your spouse, you end that relationship. You can't walk away from things that you love. And so the veiled threat that we're going to walk away if you natives don't start you know, getting rid of your grass skirts and putting on a suit makes Israelis have no interest in what they're saying because they feel like they're being spoken to in a kind of a derisive, condescending, dismissive way, and that doesn't create dialogue. So the criticism itself, it seems to me, is entirely legitimate. And in fact, most American Jews who are criticizing Israel are not saying anything that the Labor Party's not saying. I mean, really, the Labor Party's not any more to the right than many American Jews, except for like, you know, BDS and JVP and all that kind of stuff. But but most of the, the, the Israeli left and much of the American liberal left are saying exactly the same thing. The difference is that those kids on the Israeli left, they went to the army. And their parents are paying 50% income tax. And they're living a life which, for all that I think it's a fantastic place to live, is not as comfortable and is not as secure a life as has long been the case here. Uh, so I think it's fine to be on the critical side, but then you have to go extra out of your way to show that this is criticism born of love not criticism born of a, an attitude, which is if you don't do what I want, I'm going to walk away. Yeah, that's right. So it is an interesting way to compare. Is it a spousal relationship that you start and you can end at some point? Or is it like a patrilineal or matrilineal relationship, right? Where, again, it's something that lasts forever. The question is, how do you reconcile that? We're a people. I mean, it's a family. You can't walk away from your family. I mean, you can walk away. Uh, but you just work it out on the couch after that. In other words, this is built into your DNA. We have to be rooted to each other in our DNA. We can disagree. We've disagreed for thousands of years. But let's disagree with the understanding that we are part of this, we are part of this entity called the Jewish people that has risen and fallen over the course of the last 4,000 years, largely to, on the degree to which it's actually held itself together. Yeah, you know, I, I often, if I might for a moment, I often find it amazing that I mean, we are the people who invented the idea of commentary and dissent and disagreement. And so the inability of leaders to handle disagreement seems very, very much in contradiction to, as you're pointing out, like who we are. So, so there are a bunch of questions from the audience. I want to sort of try to bring these into the conversation. And if others haven't yet submitted, I would encourage you to, to do so. So I'm just going to ask. So, we talked about uh, the election, or we alluded to the election, I would say. And someone asks, isn't a strong nationalist USA a benefit for Israel? Is it possible you have misread the ramifications for Israel of Donald Trump's victory? No, it's not possible. And of course it's possible. Um, <laughs> it depends on what you mean by nationalist. There's Hungarian nationalism and there's British nationalism. If it's a Hungarian style nationalism, it's a horrible thing for the Western world. If it's a British nationalism that says we don't want any part of the European Union because we have our own traditions and our own heritage and we want to, that's all well and good. Um, 
Nobody has any idea what this next administration is going to bring for Israel. Nobody has any idea. I think the president-elect has no idea. I mean, I mean, I said that not, not to be cute, not to be funny. He ran, for, he ran saying that he was going to move the embassy to Jerusalem. Of course he wasn't going to move the embassy to Jerusalem. Because first of all, the State Department's never going to let it happen. And second of all, if he does try to do it, buses in my neighborhood are going to start blowing up. So would I like the embassy to be in Jerusalem? Yes. Would I like to go through what I went through between 2000 and 2004 to have the embassy in Jerusalem? No. The embassy is not moving to Jerusalem. Everybody in Israel understood that all the way through. He's going to rip up the Iran deal. The Iran deal was made with a whole array of states. You can't just rip it up. So he's going to have to figure out, first of all, how this really works. What his instincts are, I think we don't know yet. On the one hand, he said a lot of really great things about supporting Israel. On the other hand, we have a person who's spoken a lot about an isolationist American policy, which is, the, is exactly opposite of that. We really, really, really don't know what we're getting, and we have to wait and see. I'll just say two things about it. One of them has nothing to do with Israel and everything to do with American Jews. You don't need to have a PhD in Jewish history, which I don't have. You don't need to know a lot about Jewish history. You need to know just a little bit to know that there has never, ever, 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 ever been a society in which Jews have lived that was animated fundamentally by hate in which they didn't eventually come for the Jews. There's never been such a society. This notion that, well, he hates Muslims and he hates Hispanics and this and that, but he likes the Jews, that's just ridiculous. It's first of all immoral, but it's also ridiculous. And I have to say that I think that um, American Jews are as confident of their place in America as the Jews of Berlin were in 1933, and the Jews of Cordoba were in 1490, and the Jews wherever they lived in England were in 12, whatever. That's not to suggest that anybody's gonna come rounding anybody up. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the Jews have every reason to be nervous about societies that are consumed by hate, both because it's the actual opposite of the Jewish vision of what a good society is, and because it's never worked out well for the Jews. The other thing I'll say about it is this. I think that there's a way in which Israel Israel can lose either way, and I'll tell you what I mean. If Donald Trump proves to be not where you think he ought to be on Israel, you know, he's critical, he does this, he does that, whatever it is, uh, then obviously you're gonna think Donald Trump's not good for Israel. And if Donald Trump is overwhelmingly in favor of Israel and pro-Israel, and as Congress and the American populace now becomes ever more divided, Israel will then become a Republican issue. There will come a day when the Republicans will not have the White House. And there will come a day when the Republicans will not have Congress. It could be four years, eight years, 12 years, 20 years. I don't know when it's going to be, but the day is going to come. And at that point, all of the celebration of those people who think that Donald Trump's going to do exactly the right thing for Israel now have to remember that when that bounces back and Israel is a right-wing issue, when Democrats take the White House and Congress back and a young angry left-wing population wants to do to the right what it thinks the right's about to do to them now, Israel is going to suffer from that terribly. Israel needs to be a nonpartisan issue. It cannot ever become a wedge issue. <laughs> Which makes navigating this current terrain very hard. I don't, I really, I say this with, with, with all due respect, I don't envy you, know, you or a lot of the other heads of American Jewish organizations who have to, on the one hand, uphold a clear moral voice, which has always been Judaism's responsibility to speak truth to power, and on the other hand, not estrange the powers that be because you gotta also do the work of, of protecting the Jewish community. It's a very, very hard thing to do, and um, one of the many, many reasons I'm glad I live over there. But, um, but I think we, so we have to, it's, it's gonna be a very tough period. It's a very tough period. And anybody who thinks they know what's coming down the pike just doesn't. We just don't know what's coming, and we don't even know what would be good for us to have coming down the pike. I deeply agree. I mean it. And I think the thing that Daniel said, if there are a few things you take away from tonight, this idea of remembering that we cannot afford for Israel to become a partisan issue. Oh, there we actually disagree. I think your takeaway from tonight should be a copy of the book, but that's okay. <laughs> I stand corrected. But so, what, now I, there's a good question here. Um, as much as I think very often we find ourselves criticizing what's coming from the right, I don't think the, the left is exempt from intolerance either. There's a very interesting question here from a student in the audience. As a graduate student at a well-respected university, 
I am frequently told by my professors that the Jewish people are an invention, that ancient Israel is an invention, and that this gross existential debasement comes from professors who are themselves Jewish. How do I react in the classroom and outside of it? Are they right? How can I pursue my studies without crumbling? How do I stop feeling apologetic, like you said? It's, I, I'm just sighing because the American University campus has become a battleground in a way that would have been unthinkable. I mean, just unthinkable. I, was, I went to a school not that far from here on the corner of 116th Street and Broadway. And I was there for four years, and I was very, you know, I was, I was involved in all these Jewish things, and I was a little bit involved in Israel stuff. And in four years, there wasn't a single unpleasant incident. And Edward Said actually published Orientalism while I was there. So the Jewish students said, Mazel Tov, you know, you get tenure, it's a good thing. <laughs> we believe in tenure. And the Jewish, law, the Jewish office thing, they didn't have a Hillel building back then, was literally next door to the Muslim office thing. And everyone's like, hey, how's it going? Everything was fine. And I'm actually going to speak at Columbia on Monday night because I go back like every couple of years because the students just want some support. They feel so embattled. And the buildings all look the same and the campus is exactly the same and the culture is just completely unrecognizable. So when this young woman writes this, it just I find it devastatingly sad. Now look, part of what's, I mean, part of the reason that the left got punished here is because there is a kind of echo chamber in which the left starts talking to itself and convincing itself of, not everything, but that some absurdities, you repeat them enough and enough, you begin to believe them. So Shlomo Sand, by the way, at Tel Aviv University, wrote a book called The Invention of the Jewish People. But I mean, really, Jews' enemies and Jews' supporters for thousands of years have been talking about the Jewish people. Do we know exactly what happened at the exodus from Egypt? Who really glommed on? Oh, that's an archaeological divide, and you know, scholars are, are split on that. But this notion that the, 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 um, the Jewish people is a kind of invention, Shlomo Sands, that's an invention of the Zionist movement so it could justify stealing land from the Arabs. I mean, it's so stupid on so many levels. It's so academically indefensible that when you actually have tenured professors teaching a graduate course saying that, you don't even know where to begin. The only thing I would say is this. When I was at Columbia, the Saudis actually started to endow chairs. I thought to myself, I know they got a lot of money, but that's ridiculous. What are they doing? I mean, I was 18, 19, 20, what did I understand? They were very damn smart. They were very damn smart because they did it in a lot of places and they changed the discourse on campuses. Now, the American Jewish community doesn't like to say it out loud, but it's true. There's actually no limit to the resources the American Jewish community can bring to bear on anything. There's just no limit. There are lots of Jewish American billionaires. So why don't we fight back? Why don't we also endow chairs? Uh, this woman that just got fired from Oberlin. I mean, she got fired from Oberlin for saying really vile and disgusting stuff. Because at the end of the day, the trustees and the donors to Oberlin said, you got to make a choice, Mr. President. You can, have, you can have her or you can have us. Now, I don't think we should use the power of the wallet over every single little thing. That would be wrong and stupid. But when there was a clear violation of either academic integrity or academic freedom, I don't understand why we have to sit back and whine and worry when, in fact, we could actually exercise some power and exercise some control. I don't think that's malevolent and I don't think it's manipulative. I think it's actually insisting on a high degree of academic and intellectual integrity. It's just very sad what happens. How does this particular young woman you know, navigate it? I don't want to be cavalier and I don't want to be dismissive, but I think you gotta, if it's really that bad, you gotta find a department where you can study what you want to study where you're not gonna deal with that. And just like when parents pick neighborhoods and they buy a house and they want to know sort of what are the taxes and how safe is the neighborhood and what are the public schools like. I think when we pick a graduate department, we have to know what's the job placement like and what's the requirements like and what's the tuition like and how much am I going to be made to suffer because I'm a Jew who's not ashamed of it. There's got to be departments in this country where that's still possible and they're the ones that should get our support and they're the ones that should get our students. Yeah, I can tell you and uh, we see this a lot. You know, we had, the ADL has 26 field offices across the country, and it's been very disturbing, just for me, and I've only been in the job almost 16 months, give or take, to see how this, this climate has really descended on so many campuses. 
And I would tell you, by the way, what's interesting is it is much more of a function of the liberal arts environment than it is like the engineering oh, sure. or business school environment. I taught at Wharton before, for a few months before I started, nothing. My alma mater, Tufts University, battleground. I mean, the distinction is really quite, quite stark. So how does this, tell us as an as Israeli, how does this debate, how is it perceived in Israel? What is the perception of the American University, or do Israelis even care about that? And this whole BDS debate, if you will. Well, they know about BDS. That they definitely know about, because the Israeli government is actually trying to help other governments and other local organizations in various places fight BDS. I think the average Israeli doesn't know a lot about the American University campus setting. I mean, in fairness, you know, how much do most people here know about the average campus setting in France? I mean, it, it could be this, it could be that. Most people have no idea, and that's not an indictment. You just don't live in France. Um, and Israelis don't live in America, so they don't really know. They know that BDS is a huge problem, um, but they don't, I don't think they associate it particularly with the academic environment on campus. Basically, they know that it also happens there, but they see it, rightly or wrongly, as a, as a wider phenomenon. So another question that came from the crowd, why isn't the case for Israel ever made in terms of its diversity? Not only should there be a Jewish state in the Middle East, but a Christian state, Kurdish state, et cetera. What do you think about that? Well, first of all, I think that actually Israel should make its, a case for itself in terms of diversity, in terms of the diversity of Israel. Uh, you know, people like most of us in this room, we're an overwhelmingly Jewish crowd, not exclusively, and we're an overwhelmingly Ashkenazi crowd, not exclusively. We are a minority in Israel. Ashkenazi Jews are less than half of the Jews in Israel. It is North African and Yemenite and Iraqi and Iranian Jews and so forth who are the majority of Jews in Israel right now. By the way, that's also part of the problem that American Jews have with sort of digesting this Israel thing. It's not acting so Western anymore. It's acting pretty Middle Eastern. And it has a different notion of, of negotiation, and it has a different notion of power. It has a different sense of what's polite and what's not polite. And by the way, I say this, not kiddingly and not derisively, throw a million Russians into the mix who bring a different kind of ethos altogether, but also distinctly non-Western. And you have a lot of, the, Miri Regev. I mean, Miri Regev, who is, you know, the time has just ran, as you pointed out to me, I hadn't seen it, uh, ran this really long profile of Miri Regev, and she makes a lot of people really upset. Miri Regev grew up in a, in a poor development town, basically, in Israel, and her parents are immigrants, one, I think, from Morocco and one from Spain. She's part of that Mizrahi underclass that swept Menachem Begin into power, that then created Shas, the quasi-Haredi party, and is now exacting its revenge. And part of what they don't care about is what we think of how they comport themselves. They just don't care. Because they, have, they say, you know, you elitists, you've been doing this to us for a very long time. We're now the majority. And I'm just saying that that complicates sort of this picture that we're, that we're talking about. But the larger, the larger issue is um, it's very, very complicated. The fact that Palestinians are sneaking into Israel um, because they're gay and lesbian and they can go to Tel Aviv and live their lives the way they want to, but if they came out in the, the West Bank, they'd be shot or killed by their parents. Um, you know, I mean, it's a horrible thing, but it's actually something that Israel should take some pride in, that even Palestinians understand the freedom of, of Israeli society. Uh, Israel's diverse religiously, Israel's diverse culturally in a lot of ways. Now, should there, be, should there be a Kurdish state? There really should be a Kurdish state. The Kurds want Kurdistan, and I think that if you are committed to the principles that make Zionism legit, then you should actually be committed to Kurdistan. Because the idea is that ethnicities and religions and peoples yeah. should have their own place. There is, I think, not exactly a shortage of Christian states across the country, across the world, so I'm a little bit less compelled to create another Christian country in the region, although certainly happy for it to happen. Um, but there, so the first part is I think Israel itself is very, very diverse. The second part, I think that genuine, I think that I'll make it even more edgy. I think that if one is really a principled Zionist, one should be in favor of a Palestinian state. 
because if you really believe in the possibility of ethnic self-determination, let's put aside the question of whether the Palestinians are a people or not, just like we should put aside the question of whether the Jews are a people or not. It's not the same thing. There is an interesting academic argument to be had about the Palestinians, but at this point, they see themselves as a people, the world sees them as the people, that perception is not going away. So let's not have the academic argument anymore, let's just accept reality for what it is and say, therefore, if you believe that the Jews have a right to self-determination, because that's their homeland, and ethnicities thrive when they are on their natural homeland and they guide their own futures. Uh, my belief in a Palestinian state stems not from large-heartedness, it stems from my Zionism. I think it's good for Israel, first of all, to be at peace with its neighbors, and I think it's bad for Israel to subdue another population, no matter how, how benignly it might try or not try to do it. But I also really think that the principles that make Zionism legit make Palestinian self-determination legit. We just have to get to a point where the Palestinians want a state more than they want the Jews not to have a state. When we get to that point, we're gonna have a different situation. So that's a good segue to another question from the audience. Do you believe there are any potential Palestinian leaders that truly want and will pursue peace? Yeah, there are. Um, Ali Abu Awad is one of them. You've never heard of him. Uh, but you should find him. He's on Facebook, of course. Um, and he's on Twitter. He's an amazing guy. He spent a lot of time in Israeli jail. And um, his brother was killed by Israeli troops. The Israeli army and his family have different narratives of how that happened, but his, nobody denies that his brother was shot by Israeli troops. His mother was in Israeli jail. Uh, there's a family with a long history of sort of, they're the Jabotinskys of the Palestinian side. You know, they're the underground of the Palestinian side. They are the hardcore. And he was in jail at a certain point and began to, I forget what the exact circumstances were, he told me, but I've forgotten already, but he, something happened and he met the parents of suicide bomber victims who cried. And he said to me, I never imagined a Jew crying. And he said something just changed. He said he saw a Jew cry and all of a sudden he recognized, all right, this got out, we gotta do something different here. And he eventually got out of jail and he lives just south of Jerusalem, actually just inside Gush Etzion. And what they do is they do all this cooperative um, educational stuff with Arab kids and with the children of settlers. Not my, you know, sort of, you know, westernized, you know, they call them, you know, Zionist light kids. Hardcore settlers, the real settlers, the guys whose parents carry M16s. And they, they do stuff with them. They have kindergartens and they have summer camps and they have all kinds of stuff. He's saying it's gonna be ground up. Now, there are people like Ali Abu Awad who are out there. He's an amazing guy um, and he's actually really interested in meeting people like you, uh, both, quite frankly, because he needs support and also because he wants to tell you his story and he wants to make it clear that there are Palestinians like that. The problem is, is that they don't get very high in the Palestinian political echelons, and the higher they get, the more in danger their lives are. So the Palestinians are very happy for him to plant trees, which is actually what he does. Um, he plants trees a lot, and they build forests together with Jewish and Palestinian kids, which is actually very, it's very moving. It's really, it's really unbelievable. We were there, actually, the last time on Pesach, and we brought some Canadian friends of ours with us, and it was just like, it's an unbelievable way to celebrate the feast of, the festival of freedom by going to hear this guy. It's just, it's just unbelievable. The challenge for Palestinian life, for the, Palestinian, the challenge for the Palestinian community is, to, is gonna be to let people like Abu, Ali Abu Awad and many others like him move up the ladder. Look what happened to Mahmoud Abbas when he went to Shimon Peres' funeral. He went 10 miles, he went to a funeral, and he came home. And he was really in political hot water for going to a funeral. When you combine that, and you combine the naming of the square for the mastermind of the Germany, that's just not a culture that's gonna move this thing forward. And Ali, Ali, Ali Abu Awad, <laughs> is now much more afraid of the Palestinians than he is of the Jews. He, the, Jew, the Israeli jail thing is way behind him. He doesn't love his jailers, I'm sure, but he knows that if he gets killed, it's not gonna be by a Jew. Mm. Uh, and that's what has to change in Palestinian society, and nothing that Israel can do to change that. And I think the only thing that the, the West can do to possibly change that, although you have to remember that the Muslim world, tragically, is consuming itself in this kind of hatred and internecine fighting, um, but if there's anything that the Western world can do to move that forward, uh, it is to convince the Palestinians that time is not on their side. Right now they think, and they're right, that time is on their side. They just have to hold out. 
And what Bibi Netanyahu, by the way, and I'm not a big Bibi fan, just you know, go to my Twitter feed or go to my Facebook page. I am not a big Bibi fan. But when Bibi says, you know, we're gonna not knock down Amona, this thing that happened today, or we're gonna build here, or we're gonna build there, what he's not saying is we're never gonna have a state. You're never gonna have a state. We have very big bulldozers. They knock down buildings in Gaza, they can knock down buildings in the West Bank. All he's saying is if I stop building now, I've rewarded them for not moving. They have to understand that the more I build, I may take down 90% of it, but I'm not taking down 100% of it. So the more it creeps, the less you're gonna get. Now, if they heard that from Washington and London and Berlin and Madrid also, things would be very different. Tragically, Bibi's voice and the voice of the Israeli right is a kind of a lone voice in the wilderness, not saying that there shouldn't be a state, if I understand them correctly, but saying that there's no reason that Israel should make concessions before they make concessions, not because we don't want to be friarim, as we say in Hebrew, but because it's bad for the peace process. Yep. It's bad for the peace process for them to think that by holding out, they're going to win. They have to understand that the longer they hold out, the worse their position is going to be, but that's not going to... That, by the way... By the way, a changed rhetoric from the White House might move that forward. Quite, quite possible. I don't know. Here's the question I'm supposed to ask you. I thought this is to you, but okay. Um, you say that fear moves people to the right. Well, the right fills me with fear. I believe American Jews need to speak and act. Tomorrow's ADL summit is a good start. What do we do as individuals to stop the move to the right, to prevent future Hitlers? And then it's signed. I think both Danny and I could answer that question. So let me just sort of acknowledge that we both should take that on. You got it. Uh, look, I don't, let me just be clear about one thing. Hitler is not around the corner. He's not around the corner. He's not. There's, there is a tide that's happening here in the country that should give us all pause. There is a reason to be concerned. But we don't yet have brown shirts goose stepping in the streets. So I just want to note that. You'll hear me say some things that are very strong criticism. And the critici we should be capable of criticizing even the president-elect. We, we can optimistically engage with him and hope we can find common cause on Israel, on other issues. And we should hold him relentlessly accountable to the issues that we care about. And vigorously pursue those issues. But it's not Hitler. With that said, what can you do if you want a different outcome, we're a 501c3 and don't take a position on politics. I may have said some things over the course of the past 12 months, but it was always about ideas, not about individuals. It was always about prejudice, not about politics. But if you don't like the outcome, go get mobilized. Come to our conference, number one, tomorrow, where you can learn a lot, but go get mobilized. Go register people to vote. Go organize people in your home for parlor meetings. Go get involved at the city and state level. There are, we have such, there are so many tools at your disposal here. We live in the most, this, I do believe in American exceptionalism. I deeply believe in American exceptionalism. America has been good, and it has been particularly good to the Jews. So, you know, as, as um, Dan, you kind of said this before, like, if you had asked my grandfather, when he was a young man in Germany, if he thought his grandchildren would be born here in the U.S. I did this once for a high school project, I asked him. And he said in his very thick German accent, of course not. To the extent I thought about that, I thought my grandchildren would have been born right here in Germany, maybe Austria. Where else would we go? And if you ask my father-in-law this question, as I have, who was born in Tehran and left after the Islamic Revolution and after the Iran-Iraq War and came to this country, as a refugee. You ask him, say, Mansur Khan, did you ever think your grandchildren were born here in America? My children. He would say, as he says, no, of course not. Maybe Israel, but probably right here in Iran. Where else would we go? If you want your grandchildren and their children to be born here in America, we have to work for the privileges that we have here to preserve them and keep them. Voting, engaging, mobilizing, and taking nothing for granted. Well, look, I want to, uh, then what I'll, I'll, I'll close by saying what a privilege it is for, have, for me to have the opportunity to engage with you today in such a terrific conversation. Thank you so much. For My pleasure. Time. Thank you for what you did. We 
would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.